So what everybody has said so far is amazing. Our story um, is not so amazing. Our son died September 2015 from a fatal overdose of fentanyl. We had no idea that our son was doing drugs. He was 27, moved out of the house like most young men do at that age. He had a college education in actuarial science, which coincidentally, uh, you forecast risk. That, that's the science of forecasting risk for insurance companies. He was a brilliant kid. He's a great athlete. We had no idea that he had what he, what his friends told us later was a prescription pill hobby. We had no idea. We knew he liked to drink. We knew he smoked some pot. When he was in high school, we caught him plenty of times. We had plenty of conversations about drinking and doing drugs and unsafe behavior. Never, ever did it cross our mind to have a conversation about doing prescription pills. Um, number one, you know, I, I, we never took pills, and I had no idea what a narcotic or an opioid was. I didn't understand why someone would take something like that. And then when we had a couple of surgeries, uh, I mean, Jim and myself with, with joint replacements, we had OxyContin in the house. And unfortunately, we didn't respect the power of that, and it was right in our spice cupboard with the chocolate sprinkles and the brown sugar and vitamin pills. We had no idea, and uh, for that, we will always be guilty and take that to our grave that we just didn't know. And so we have been spending since September 2015 trying to get the word out to people to know the signs, to have conversations, like um, Grace, Grace. Uh, that was just wonderful. And to also know that, um, yeah, alcohol and marijuana, those are gateway drugs, and that definitely leads kids down the path. And we've been going around to high schools telling kids those stories. If you ever have a chance, and I think it's in our brochure that Jim will hand out, we did create a documentary that we share with uh, high school kids. It's called Just the One Time. And uh, the kids that were with our son the night he overdosed um, came back to our house and we made a film and they're very candid about what happened that night. And there are a lot of red flags that when you watch it, you're like, oh, right? So hindsight's always 20-20. But it's a good tool to use for older kids to have a conversation. You can watch that movie and have a great conversation about some of the red flags in it. So um, that link will be available later. And Jim's going to talk about the Zero Left Initiative. Right. It's, uh, I was listening to Grace and Devin and wish we had uh, absorbed something like that ourselves, right? Because, uh, as Jean said, we never had that conversation at all. And uh, do we know that Adam would be alive if we had had that conversation? No, we don't. But would we have had a better chance of him being alive had we had that conversation? Absolutely. So let's start there. That's our, we beg. You know, and I honestly, I um, I feel like I'm, you were diligent enough to come here. Most of you know this already, but it's all a matter of um, continuing to spread the message, you know. Um, so when Adam died, I had previously scheduled knee surgery, elective surgery, and when it, and it was uh, went ahead with that surgery a couple weeks after he died. I thought that it would give it me plenty of time to heal physically and emotionally. I didn't have to go back to work for a little bit. Um, so the good news was I had plenty of time to think. The bad news was I had plenty of time to think. 
and you know maybe uh, so that's where oh, it, hang on so that's where the whole zero left initiative came from so Gene and I may not be the brightest bulbs in the planet, but we're not dumb. We're not idiots. And, how, and we said to ourselves, how did we miss this? How did we never have a conversation, bring it up, or talk about it in our house once ever? And we had, in the end, we're not blaming anybody. We're saying, going forward, how would others prevent that? So one thing is through forums like this. But another is, uh, where do the prescription opioids begin? In healthcare. And so I enlisted some, I'm a, I, I work in a hospital. I'm not, I, uh, opioids are a necessary part of healthcare. Rather than take a position that they're gonna go away, that's not realistic. We need them. People use, some people use them every day. They're a, a, a part of acute care recovery, essential. But what, I, I, and so I'm a scrub tech, I have a surgical tech in, in, in the operating room, and I work with some surgeons, you know, this far away for eight hours at a time. And you develop relationships. And thankfully, we had some surgeons say, Jim, how can we help? What, what can we do? And through all that, working together, we kind of developed this program called Zero Left. And it basically says that when you are prescribed the product, there is, uh, the state has initiated some wonderful disclosure mandatory laws that now when you're given an opioid, and this is of January 1st, 2017, just happened, you know, that you must, you, know, you, you have to sign a piece of paper that says this using this drug may cause addiction. Using this drug can cause you to stop breathing. Using this, yeah, when you use this, lock it in a medicine cabinet. Lock it and return it when you're done to a take back location. And that, in a, in a sense, is what this is. So initially I, I had a bigger one that I used Delivered this message to healthcare, you know, uh, the hospital where I work at Exeter Hospital. Right? So I went to went to there, but then I thought, well, patients should have one. So uh, through some advocacy there from certain, you know, a few key surgeons, we have some. We've started this initiative there, and these are in the lobby. These are in the waiting rooms, and there's a smaller version that goes in the room that you wait for the doctor to come into, and then. When this is given to you, it's given to you with this wrapped around it. And then these are also handed out. But what it does is it's all about the education when you absorb the product. And so that you know all these potential things, right? You know, opioids being a necessary part of healthcare. And then it's, it implores you to uh, safely store the product when it's in your home. And it implores you to get rid of the product, take the product as little as you can, and get rid of it as soon as you can. To actually bring a close to the prescription cycle. It's not an opioid, or not an open-ended situation where you say, I'll leave some there in case. Draw the line, begging people to draw the line and get rid of it. And the, the, the ways you get back, get rid of it is, thankfully, uh, Celeste, you had, where was the drug hit back in Raymond? Walgreens. Walgreens, and you had a great turnout there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that compares to you, but collectively for the state, this state, in 2016, I think they got rid of 12,700 pounds collectively, and in one day, last Saturday, we got rid of nearly 15,000 pounds. That 12,000 something hundred pounds, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, much, much more not, we also have a take back box in the lobby of the police station. It's there 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and probably anything off your That's great. So, uh, take back 
events like the DEA sponsored, in which they, in one day, they outdid what they took in two days the previous year. That's a good sign. That's a good sign that people are all contributing. Everybody wants to do something. And you know, people all would, people would come to say it to us when Adam died, how can we help? What can we do? And that's one way to help. Because it isn't just the fact that you're getting rid of the product, it's knowing why you're doing that. You know, the education that comes involved in that too. So that education will carry forward through to your either your children or your grandchildren or your friends, your neighbors, anybody. So, um, so there's the that take back days. There's the take back at every day here in this town, and I think there's 70, nearly 80 police stations that take it back every day of the year across the state. And what I've what we implore in this is, and I think those things are great. But um, some people, not everybody is real comfortable going into a police station. So we'd see that as perhaps a limitation. And so they're beginning to put take back canisters. Uh, it's like a mailbox and it's bolted to the wall and it's under 24 hour surveillance from the camera and it's bolted to the floor. It's very, very secure in the hospital. So when you go to your next prescription or your next appointment, you can return what you use. Just dump it in the mailbox. And when that gets full, there's a system of, of, of the way to get rid of it. And the final approach is these things. This is what's called a deactivation bag. And this is actually what Extra Hospital is using in force now. And that when you go in for your, you, know, you had your surgery and your, you go through the disclosure, and you're educated and etc. And you use as few pills as you can. And some people are more, more stoic than others. And some use them all, some need more. A lot of people, like myself, when I had my knee replaced, I used a third of what I got. So I have 100 pills here. Now what do I do with these? You know. So this, uh, so what they do is when you come into the follow-up visit to the hospital, you're, they say, how many pills did you use? Do uh, you have some left? You know, and if you do, they send you home with one of these. And this is a uh, bag that you just tear the top off of. It's got a, you add water, put your pills into it, shake it up. It's a deactivated charcoal in here. And you can toss this in your trash. This is, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's effectively the, the pills are neutralized in 30 seconds. And fully neutralized. I mean, a lot of the recommendation is to Mix them with cat, uh, kitty litter, or coffee grounds. And really, in, in truth, what that does is makes them makes the pills dirty and doesn't prevent their contamination of the environment. So there's all kinds of things. You know, it's, this gets the pills out of your house. This protects the environment. And to me, what this is is an education. This is screening education. Why is this in my house? Why can't I leave these pills around? And why do I need to do? All the sum effect is <clears throat> uh, one joint, the joint surgeon who did my knee and who's been a very big ally in this. What he did is when he gave this to, he gave this to people, and then they they put a little business reply card on the top, and it said simply, "How many pills did you dispose of?" And in the two months that he did it, he and so the business reply card they just drop it in the mail and it comes back to the hospital. In the two months that he did it. 1,100 pills were disposed of through, I don't know how many patients that would be, but it's around 100. Mm -hmm. All right, so, and he, and he wasn't, you can take any pill in your house, you know, I mean, just clean out the cabinet. So the, the bottom line is this type of messaging can be so helpful across all of healthcare, and I don't know who has influence in any of that, but it's, we're starting something and we hope it grows, and like the stone thrown into the pond, it can spread from there. And um, actually, Exeter's getting something going, it's going okay, and uh, I think there's a, a group of hospitals that are gonna bite into it and take it regionally, <coughs> and then uh, we'll see where it can go from there. But again, the, the benefit is disposing of it, protecting the environment, and the education provided in it. Because again, we never had that conversation. And
because somewhere along the line, we never absorb the impact of what these things can do. I mean, we take them and it doesn't bother us. You line up, I don't know how many people, you say 20, and give them to 20 people, there's 20 different reactions, but I guarantee you, one person in that 20 is gone. Their life has changed. Whether or not they were abusing products before, that's, you know, it is an addictive product. It is a euphoric producing product with certain personalities. And you never know who that's going to be. It's going to treat everybody the same. So, uh, oh wait, we're going to do questions after. Yeah, go ahead. Jim, the question is, and I think you just answered it a minute ago, Exit is the only hospital that has this material? Right. And so it has to start somewhere. We have them in our house. I think it's great. How are we going to get the rest of the hospitals in the state to do it? Well, maybe that guy I know they're going to know. You know, I have to say, I mailed, I, I took, uh, this and roll it up, and this, and this, and and the pouch, and some oh a, a larger brochure that summarizes this, and mail it to, uh, put it into a two three inch tube mailers, and I mail it to every state senator in New Hampshire, and all local representatives, and Devin got one, and anybody who I thought was in a leadership position, and I know a lot of people read it and said that's nice. You know, of, of the senators and the representatives, how many responses I got? Zero. Zero. That's but I, exciting, isn't it? But I did get one great response. Governor Sununu. He responded in 24 hours. And I got to sit down with he and James Barrett, who's the head of the whole program. And uh, they're definitely on, you know, I'm, I'm not saying these senators are not against it. It's just that I was a little disappointed that nobody had the energy to proactively react. I don't blame you. Yeah, thank you. But good job. But we're, we're all in. We're all in this fight together. Keep it up. Thank you. You know, and like I say, there's no. We're not saying you take a pill and you're all of a sudden an opioid addict. That's not the case. It's it's very complicated. And Devin's messages. Grace's message, I mean, my God, you know, wonderful stuff. We'll all work together, and we're going to get somewhere, right?